It's time to go off on our travels again, and this time we're going to pay a visit to a star system which is not just one, but has multiple planets, and one of them happens to lie in the habitable zone for that star. We're going to Kepler-186. Let's find out more. Located about 582 light years away, we find our star of interest. If you want to see it from Earth, you'd need to point yourself in the constellation of Cygnus and have a pretty powerful telescope. Let's go there now, in our space and time machine, it's just a short hop. Let's turn our attention firstly to the star, Kepler-186. This is an M-class red dwarf star. Although it's a large red dwarf, on the border between red and orange stars, this star is about half the diameter of our Sun, with about half its mass as well. This means it has about 5% the luminosity of our Sun. This star also has a much lower metallicity than our Sun. As far as astronomers are concerned, metals are any elements that aren't hydrogen or helium, so anything with an atomic number above 2. And considering that 98% of the visible universe is made from hydrogen or helium, and everything else makes up just 2%, that seems quite sensible. Metallicity is important when looking at stars, because stars and their planets were made from the same cloud of gas and dust. And so the amount of metals in the material that was available to make the planets will influence how many planets can be made and what type of planets. Stars with a low metallicity tend to have a lower probability of large gaseous planets like Jupiter and Saturn, but actually a higher probability of rocky worlds like our own. And we found five planets orbiting this star, and all of them appear to be rocky planets. We'll have a look at each of the planets, starting with the closest, and move outwards. We can start with the inner three planets. These are called Kepler-186b, C and D. And these planets all orbit very close to the star. Kepler-186b orbits at a distance of just 0.038 astronomical units. That's just 5.7 million kilometres and it orbits the star in a time of just 3 days and 21 hours. Planet C lies a little further out at 0.057 astronomical units, or just 8.55 million kilometres, and this body orbits the star in a little over 7 and a quarter days. Finally, for our initial trio, we have planet D, and this lies just 0.086 astronomical units away from the star, and that's just 12.9 million kilometres. This planet orbits the star, taking about 13 days and 8 hours to do so. If we now look at the size of these planets, they all appear to be a little larger than our Earth. Planet B is the smallest, at just 8% bigger than the Earth. Planet C comes next. This planet is about a quarter bigger than the Earth. And finally, planet D is the largest, and that's 39% bigger. All of these planets will be tidally locked with one face permanently turned towards the star, enduring the unrelenting heat from the nearby star. The other side of the planet will be forever turned away to the inky blackness and freezing temperatures of outer space, never to experience the warmth of the star. Due to their proximity, it's unlikely that these planets have any atmospheres. The harsh winds of solar radiation would blow away any atmosphere to the vacuum of space. If we were able to stand on any of these planets looking towards the star, it would hang large in the sky, dominating the view from the planet. On Earth, if you were standing facing north, and rotate yourself round in a full circle, you'd move through 360 degrees. Our Sun looks to be about half a degree across. On any of these inner planets, the star would take up a much bigger proportion of the sky. Let's move out towards the next planet, Kepler-186e. This orbits a little further out at 0.12 astronomical units, or about 18 million kilometres, and it makes one full revolution of the star in about 22 and a half days. Even though it's further out than the previous three planets, it still lies within the inner limit for the habitable zone. The planet is a third larger in radius than the Earth, and has a mass of about two and a quarter times that of our Earth. The equilibrium temperature of this planet would be 323 Kelvin. That's about 50 Celsius or 122 degrees Fahrenheit. If the planet has an atmosphere, 
it could well be similar to Venus in our own solar system. Let's finally move to the last planet on our journey, and the one that we're actually interested in. This is Kepler-186f. This planet orbits its parent star at a distance of 0.43 astronomical units. That's about 64.5 million kilometres. That's just outside where the orbit of Mercury would be in our own solar system. Kepler-186f does sit within the habitable zone for this star, but right on the outer edge, much further out than the Earth is within the habitable zone for our Sun, which sits more towards the inner edge of the habitable zone. If we take a look at the planet, it is 17% larger than the Earth, with a mass 1.4 times that of our world. This would give the planet a surface gravity about 17% higher than here. Standing on the surface of the planet, the extra gravity would be noticeable, but it wouldn't be unbearable. A 75kg or 165lb person would feel an additional 12 kilos or 28 pounds. The equilibrium temperature for this planet, in other words the temperature without taking any atmosphere into consideration, would be 188 Kelvin. That's minus 85 degrees C or minus 121 Fahrenheit. This is about 20 degrees C or 68 Fahrenheit lower than the equilibrium temperature of Mars. Mars however has very little atmosphere, and so the equilibrium temperature on Mars is very similar to the actual temperature of the planet. Kepler-186f, however, is a much larger planet, and so may have a much denser atmosphere. This could potentially have a marked impact on the actual temperature of the planet. It seems a shame to come all this way and not have a look round, so let's use our imaginations and think about what it might be like down there on the planet itself. A planet being in the habitable zone really only means that it's in the right location for liquid water to exist on the surface of the planet. As we look from above the planet, we can see seas and oceans with large polar ice caps. We'll avoid those and land near one of the bodies of water. We can see from the surface of the planet that the light is quite a bit dimmer than here on Earth. The midday sun here being equivalent to about the sun on Earth at dusk. We can also see that the light here has an orangey hue to it. Let's imagine that this planet does indeed have life, though we will need to keep it relatively simple as my limited modelling skills will be quickly exhausted. We can see here a photosynthetic organism. On Earth, the leaves of plants are green. This means that green light is reflected by the leaves and not absorbed. Here on Kepler-186, the leaves of the plants are black. This allows them to absorb all of the limited light available and eke out as much energy as possible out of that dim sunlight available. It is strange to think of life on other planets. If such life exists, it's probably going to be stranger than we imagine it is. And whilst I firmly believe that natural selection and evolution are universal frameworks for how life develops once it has originated, the idea that life would look like it does here on Earth is fanciful. Life as we know it, which is based on carbon and relies on a supply of water, would probably have some similarities to life here, but probably those similarities may be very tenuous indeed. Anyway, I think it's time to get back inside our space and time machine for the relatively short hop back to our own home world. And for now, and until next time, thank you for watching. <laughs>